Hi, my name is Esther Lunge, and I would like to share with you the testimony of how I survived a plane crash. On the 29th of October 2006, my life as I knew it changed forever. I was in Abuja waiting for a return flight to Sokoto where I was serving as a youth corper um, in the Federal Airport Authority of Nigeria, FAAN. I was a duty flight announcer, which sounds more glamorous than it actually was. On this day, I'd never been to Abuja before, but because or by virtue of the fact that I was serving in the airport, I just looked around and I was looking for frequent flyers to see when they would get up, so I would just go along with them. As we came out of the airport, about to board the plane, um, the northern heat gave way to torrential rain. And I remember thinking to myself that, oh, do they, can the pilot fly in this weather? But then I also thought to myself that they probably don't cancel flights every time that it rains. And so we got on board. Now, I used to joke with myself that, you know, um, patience was not one of my virtues. And so I really like to sit at the front of the plane. But on this day, it wasn't an option because the flight was full. And so they had given me a seat in the middle. And so there I was contemplating where my seat was. And then I heard somebody call my full name at the time, Esther Kema Amoda. And I wondered who knew me on that flight. I looked up and it happened to be the other Esther. So there was another Esther who was serving um, at the airport. I was with the airport authority. She was with the airline ADC. And so she was sitting right at the back of the plane. And so normally for someone who was already uncomfortable sitting at the middle of the plane, it was very unusual for me to go and say hi to her at the back of the plane and not just say hi, but actually sit down beside her. Um, but I say something told me now with um, hindsight, I know that it was the Holy Spirit. And so I sat down beside her, and that morning, before I had set off from um, my fellow corpus house, I had opened my devotional to read the Bible reading for the day. And it was James 3, from verse 14 to 17, that says, in, in, a, in, in paraphrase, it says, Who are you that says today, today you will do this, or tomorrow you will do that? That life is like a vapor. And so, as anybody who is about to take a trip, you pray and say, Oh Lord, let my life not be like a vapor, but you don't, you don't read it thinking that anything out of the ordinary is going to happen to you. And so I sat down beside her and I prayed, especially remembering, you know, my reading from the morning, but, you know, we always thought that it was going to be a regular flight. And so we took off. And this was around like 10.40 in the morning and we're gaining altitude. All of a sudden, you know, the plane dropped. And we thought it was normal turbulence, and so everybody was shouting Jesus, shouting Allah, but we didn't think anything was going to happen. Shortly after that, again, the plane dropped again. By this time, even though it was 11 o'clock in the morning, the emergency lights had come on in the plane. You know, outside was dark. The Christians were shouting Jesus. The Muslims were shouting Allah. Children were crying. It was a little bit of uh, mayhem. But still, we thought it was just really bad turbulence and we're waiting for the pilot to regain control of the plane. Shortly after, I look out of the window and for lack of a better way to describe it, I hear a loud bow. Um, I look back in front of me and I'm sitting exactly the way I was sitting in the air, just that in front of me now was grass. The plane had crashed. Now, people ask me, did you black out? What happened? And I always say to them that before that day, I believed in God. But that day, I believed in the power of angels. Because literally, the same way I was sitting in the air is how I was landed on the ground. And you would say, okay, maybe all of us that were in that you know, segment of the plane, that's how we landed. But that wasn't true. Because Esther, who was sitting beside me, the impact of the crash flung her somewhere else. And so it was like a dream, you know, people always ask me, how did it feel? And I say, it felt a little bit like a cartoon where you're like, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. But I did not know where I was and I wasn't quite sure what was happening. And so because I like to travel light, I had my hand luggage under my seat and it was still there, thanks be to God. You know, at the time I had the Motorola Razor. I don't know if you remember that phone. So the clip was in my my belt um, my belt hole and the phone was on the side picked up the phone put it back in the clip and then I started to um, feel my way out of where I was um, as I was doing that I heard somebody shout oh somebody help me somebody help me and it turned out to be the other Esther so the impact had flung her somewhere else 
and so I unhooked her from um, her seat and you know she had a dislocated hip and then we made ourselves we made our way out of the debris of the plane now we're in the plane and we had no idea where the plane had 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 gone how far it had gone before this happened so I don't know if I was in Kafanchan or in Kebi you know all I knew was that I was in the middle of a field somewhere and it was raining and I was just like God what is going on um, Esther, when she saw that I had my bag with me, she said, oh, she had valuables in her own bag. And so she went back into the debris of the plane to go find her possessions. Um, as we were still trying to figure out what was going on, um, I saw three ladies, one on top of each other, you know, and the one on top was trapping the other to be beneath her. These turned out to be the daughters of the Kogi state governor. Now, you know, there was also another guy who was sitting on the floor, spread eagled, and he was just looking. And I remember thinking to myself that, Uncle, please help now. We're all in shock here. It was, it was after the fact that we, I realized that there was nothing he could do because both of his legs were broken. And so I was trying to remove the lady on top, you know, and I saw things that I never want to see again in terms of bone showing and all of that stuff. And I remember her crying out in pain. And I said to her, you know, you are alive. They can fix your body. But thank God at least that you are alive. Pulled her off. And then the one in the middle, because she was um, Hausa of Hausa origin, you know, her rapper had gotten entangled in her because that's the, the native dress, isn't it? So her rapper had gotten entangled with her seatbelt. So I unhooked her, pulled her off, and then I went back to where we were standing. There was a lady who was standing, you know, her hand, you know, and her leg were, were broken, and she was crying about her brother, her brother. And I genuinely thought at the time that what had happened was the plane had broken in half. So we were on one, one side and there was another side that had other people who were in a similar position as us. Because, you know, the northern tradition is that, you know, the men sit in front and the women sit at the back. So I just thought that they were on one side and we were on another. You know, and I was like, you're alive. I'm sure they'll find your brother and your brother will be fine. But that was not to be the case. Shortly after, um, we saw villagers come out, you know, and we realized then, because of what they had said, that the plane had crashed outside of the airport. But the people in the airport did not know that the plane had crashed just outside. And so the villagers ran into the airport to let them know that the plane had crashed and also to find transportation for those of us that were able to walk. And so they came with a pickup truck to take me, the other Esther, and this house lady that was crying for her brother because we were the three that could actually walk on foot. So they took us in the pickup truck and it was probably one of the worst rides of my life because we're in the jarring, muddy field and I just kept getting bumped about and we got to the airport, airport hospital and I had an irrational desire to be as far away from the airport as possible. Because I got to the airport and it was mayhem. They were bringing in dead bodies. They were being, it was just crazy. And so I called my friends who had literally dropped me an hour or so before. And I said, this is what has happened. Please come and get me. You know, I need to be out of here. And so they came to pick me up and took me to a private hospital where the first thing that they did was to put me on a morphine drip because I had a banging headache. Um, I remember one of my friends calling me and I made small talk with her because I didn't necessarily want to let her know that I had just been in such an accident. I remember also my mother calling me and I, my mother did not know I was on the plane and so she said, oh, I heard that there's something happening, a plane that was bound for um, Sokoto crash in Abuja, the airport must be crazy. And I said, yeah, the airport is crazy. I couldn't tell her that, you know, her daughter was on that flight. And so I stayed in the airport, I um, mean, the hospital, you know, taking the drip and everything. But then um, it became apparent that I would have to go to the military hospital where the survivors were being kept so that they would not think that I had died and they just didn't find my body. And in, in, in fact, earlier Wikipedia entries say, oh, Esther Amoda, one of the plane crash um, survivors deemed dead, now alive. And so I went to the military hospital where they were keeping the survivors. And just to put it in context, of the 105 people that were on the plane, only nine survived. And of the nine that survived, only one didn't have any injuries. And that was me to the glory of God. And so I was in the military hospital and I was kept there for three days to make sure that I did not have any internal injuries, which I did not. And so the next morning, I wake up about 4 a.m. and CNN, you know, is carrying the story. And I see 
what happened. I see the part of the plane that survived and I am weeping, I am in tears. Because if you remember, I said I thought that the plane had broken in half, but that was not what had happened. In fact, the only part of the plane that survived was the tail end of the plane and literally where the, the, the mouth of that, you know, the part that survived hit the, the floor is where I was sitting. You know, and I wept. I wept. I remember a nurse saying, why are you crying? You should be happy that you're alive. I'm like, that's why I'm crying. I'm crying because, you know, I'm happy that I'm alive. And the ADC people, when they came on their courtesy um, visit, they said literally that was the only part of the plane that was intact. Everything else was um, broken pieces and broken bodies, you know, and it was very overwhelming. And so I was there, you know, and the question now became, okay, Esther, you are in, uh, you are in Abuja now. Are you going to go back to Sokoto, which is nine hours by road? Or are you going to go back to Lagos, which is also nine hours by road? Well, my mom made the decision for me. She's like, uh, are you crazy? You're coming back home to Lagos. Okay. So the next question was, okay, how are you going to get back? I was ready, I was ready to come back by road. But I remember a friend of mine saying at the time, he worked in Virgin Nigeria, and he said, the Lord did not save you on Sunday to kill you on Wednesday, you will come back by air. And I say that that's probably one of the singular decisions that actually um, cured me or started to cure me of my fear of flying because I had to get on a plane so quickly after. And so on Wednesday, I'm super excited to be coming back home. You know, I'm just, you know, in high spirits just to leave the hospital. And I get to the airport. Um, the airport manager comes to see us and he takes us on the tarmac to see the plane. And I start to weep. I am weeping. I am weeping. I am weeping. You know, and the pilots, they try to reassure me, you know, um, that they're going to do a great job and make us land safely. And so they asked me, do you want to sit in the cockpit with us? And I said, do I look like I'm crazy? I'll be at the back of the plane. You just drive us safely. And so for the 45 or 50 minute um, ride, I held on to my flatmate at the time and I held on to um, a random stranger and I was just weeping through the flight. At the end of the flight, the pilots say, we want to dedicate this flight to Esther Moda, one of the survivors of the ADC plane crash. And so the people on the plane said, oh, who is that? Who is that? And they said, no wonder, because I'm sure up until then, they probably thought I was a village girl who had never been on a plane before, hence the tears, you know. And there was clapping, there was rejoicing, people were trying to take my picture, trying to put money in my hand, telling me they're going to write books and all of that stuff, you know. And it was just a surreal experience. Now, when people um, see the trajectory of my life now, they think that, of course, it makes sense that this is the kind of life you'll be living, one that is, you know, um, bringing a message of hope and almost like serving and dedicated to God. But that was not the case. In fact, for two years after the plane crash, I had survivor's guilt. So I was depressed because I did not understand why God would give me such a phenomenal gift. I did not think that I deserved it. There were people that were more deserving on the plane. If that was the same flight that the Sultan of Sokoto his son and his grandson died on. I knew Dickens in my church and Dickenesses, you know, growing up who were on that same flight and had died. In fact, there, were, there was a mother with four children who both her and the children died. And so I didn't really feel like I deserved this great gift that God had given to me. It wasn't until November 2008 where I got, you know, um, my healing from the depression and where God said to me that I've saved you for a life eternal, then you can, you, you can accept the gift of me saving you in this life with all its wars and rumors of wars. But why am I sharing this story now? Over the last couple of months, in the last year, I have sensed that God has been calling me to serve my country. And it's that thought and the call actually gave me the most sorrow because for me, I was like, how would you ask me to serve a country that literally tried to kill me? Because in the space of 18 months, there were six plane crashes and nothing was done, you know, either by the, the Minister of Transport at the time or anything to actually say, let us do an overhaul. Let us actually see what is going on. In fact, the Minister at the time said he's not God, so why should they ask him why, um, you know, why plane crashes were happening on his watch? But in the last one year, the Lord has said, I need to serve your country. If you know anything about what is happening in our nation right now, you know that we need hope more than anything else. 
you know that we need to be able to hold on to something to believe. And I stand here, or I sit here as a sign or as a beacon of hope, saying that if the Lord can save me in such a dramatic fashion, if he can make me a sign and a wonder, because if I did not tell you, if I don't tell you that I survived a plane crash, you would never know. But if the Lord can do such a phenomenal miracle for me, he can do it for our country. He can revive us. He can revamp us. He can make it such that we don't even look like what we've been through. We look and we compare ourselves with the stories of Dubai and the stories of Singapore. And we wonder how can these, how can these things be or how shall these things be? But if we all play our part, if we all do what we are called to do, if we all live lives of integrity focused on righteousness and justice, we will have the nation that we are praying for. But it is no longer in the hands of government. It is now up to us as individuals to do the work that we have been called to do. Each and every single one of us can make a difference. And this is a plea for us to do just that. All of us cannot migrate. All of us cannot jack as they say we are here and we have a duty of care to leave Nigeria better for the next generation I hope this is inspiring you to not just hear my testimony and thank God for my life but to look inwards and say as a Nigerian could it be that I am called to be Nigerian for such a time as this thank you so much for